Philanthropology and the Good Road is brought to you by AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. Philanthropology is the companion piece to our TV show on public television called The Good Road. I'm Earl Bridges. And I'm Craig Martin, and we capture stories of mercenaries, missionaries, and misfits. It's a raw look at the messy and complicated business of global philanthropy, and Craig and I sit off around the world to places where people are doing good. Inner city ghettos, border camps for refugees, rural health clinics, and fully armed anti-poaching teams are some of the impossible situations we'll explore in season one. In the Good Road television show, we present half hour episodes where we explore this messy cocktail of community, culture, and compassion with the do-gooders who see the world's greatest problems and say, hell, I can fix that. It's positive and powerful stories of the brightest lights in the darkest corners. It's authentic storytelling about real people tackling complex issues. It's Batman, not Superman. We're looking for change makers. Do-gooders. Social impact renegades who risk it all and ask nothing in return. It's people like you. You're our people, our tribe. And this is our show. Check out The Good Road on your local PBS station starting in April. It's not every day that you find yourself in the middle of the Kenyan bush, staring down the largest elephant in the world. Earl and I were filming an anti-poaching episode for our public TV show, The Good Road. And it wasn't the staring so much that was interesting. It was the sheer panic that followed immediately after the staring. What you just heard was Tim, notable as the largest and most valued elephant in the world. Each tusk is worth 250,000 US dollars in China. So when half a million dollars of ivory wasn't happy with our presence, he started to charge Craig, me, and the crew. It was a tense moment for sure, but the world of philanthropy is fraught with risks and danger. And if you're going to do good, you are going to end up near the bad, ugly, and downright terrifying. In this first episode of Philanthropology, Craig and I want to address the risks and dangers of being a do-gooder in our world today. Stay tuned as we share stories about life on what we call The Good Road. Hear from our director, Andy Dunsing, about what it is like to film in locations that many might deem unsafe. And hear from Nick McDonald, a career humanitarian who risks his life to help people every day. So it seems like there's an infinite amount of information uploaded to the internet every day. Sometimes it's hard to know what's accurate or factual or believable. That's exactly why we love having The Great Courses Plus. This is valuable, in-depth content we can trust. This streaming service offers thousands of objective, unbiased lectures from respected professors who really know their stuff, offering their unique, expert perspectives on topics ranging from the science of evolution to the mysteries of human behavior, even how to learn a new language or how to cook, much, much more. And with The Great Courses Plus app, we can watch or listen anytime, anywhere, we highly recommend the course, Understanding the Dark Side of Human Nature. This course tackles big questions. What is evil and how can we be sure that we don't cause suffering? And an even bigger question, why do we kill? <laughs> yeah, well that's the royal we with the whole why do we kill, right? Mm -hmm. It's a really great topic that you won't wanna miss. So sign up for The Great Courses Plus today. Don't wait any longer, go to The Great Courses Plus dot com slash the good road remember the great courses plus dot com slash the good road this is it brother we're starting this podcast <laughs> philanthropology i'm excited about it it's based off the tv show well, the good road you're gonna get to see the behind the scenes interviews you're gonna get to meet some of the people that you know we consider part of our tribe right yeah yeah so the do-gooders we're calling them do-gooders that's right we're calling us you all listening do-gooders when things hit the fan do-gooders put on a cape and they run out and do-gooders don't run from the gunfire do-gooders run towards it in the TV show, we discover that people like anti-poacher Craig Miller, who helped us survive the elephant charge, you don't survive by chance, but because of expertise and smart decision-making. You know, the rangers are going out and, and, and really are risking serious injury or death almost every day. And they're, you know, they've got to be phenomenally brave, unbelievably good in the bush to, to minimize that. I do recall being with you and out with Tim, and there was that oh shit moment <laughs> when the realities of the fact that you're in the wild and, and anything can happen. Uh, you've lived that probably thousands of times. 
Uh, what what goes through your brain when you're like in one of those oh shit moments? Oh shit! <laughs> That's about it. Um, <laughs> a couple of other choice words as well. Depends on how desperate the situation gets. You know, it depends on the situation. That one in particular is is you just you're just very focused on trying to look at that elephant and read the signs and, and see what it's actually doing. And then when when it keeps getting closer and closer, then your heart starts beating faster and faster, and you begin to start looking for escape routes. And then immediately afterwards, it's generally about two or three cigarettes before I calm down. <laughs> well, philanthropology, I mean, there's a lot to cover in this thing, but I think we start with things like, what are the motivations? Yeah. But, but when people watch the trailer of our show, invariably one of the things they say is, how do you not get shot? <laughs> <laughs> and I think, um, you know, it'd be interesting if we talk to, to our director, Mm-hmm. who had never, by the way, been out of the country before. Well, right. like he'd been to, like, I don't know, somewhere in, in uh, the Caribbean. Caribbean. Yeah, something yeah, like that. That's right. Uh, but Andy Dunsing, our director, is brilliant. And to kind of hear his perspective from the very beginning of it all to, you know, being actually out there on the field, I think is fun. So, Andy, as I understand it, before the good road, oh, I guess your international travel experience has been mostly (laughs) strawberries and champagne pedicures in the uh, Caribbean. But tell us, was this kind of the first international travel that you had been involved in? As you say, I had traveled to places like Aruba, which is (laughs) can be really extreme and dangerous if you're not careful. (laughs) <laughs> right. <laughs> the pina colada might not be oh, well, at the exact right. And if the towels are too warm. <laughs> yeah, and I had been to the UK, but that's kind of like just another version of America in a lot of ways. So I don't really feel like I got to experience anything outside of the the norm until I got brought onto the show and I was immediately thrown into a three-week trip into the bush in <laughs> Kenya, Tanzania, middle of the Indian Ocean. I guess that's yeah, not the, the That's bush, right. And everywhere but. in between, all the spots in between. <laughs> the prep work is what. Yeah. After, after spending way too much time like online looking at things at REI that I thought I needed, I realized there were some practical things I needed just to get in the country. And that was vaccinations because I didn't have any vaccinations um, for a number of reasons. But not only did I have to get vaccinations, but the very first vaccination I ever had to get was the yellow fever vaccine. I, you know, all vaccines have waivers and things I now know, but the yellow fever vaccine is particularly harrowing because you, you go into this place and you're signing this thing and checking all these boxes that are like, you know, you may have an adverse reaction. These are the possible side effects. Okay, you know, you're reading it, you're reading it. Oh, death. <laughs> is what. Oh, yeah, that. <laughs> and the thing about it was like I was talking to the woman about when I left and I told her, you know, I was leaving about three weeks or maybe it was two and a half weeks. It was some ridiculously short amount of time. And she was like, oh, well, you realize this vaccine has to be in your system for over a month for you to generate the <laughs> antibodies that will actually protect you from yellow fever. We probably gave you a month to get it done. <laughs> it, it, well, so I have to get this vaccine, which might kill me, but it won't be effective in case I get yellow fever. I, I was saying, so you're telling me that this isn't going to work if I get yellow fever. And she's like, it might, but probably not. <laughs> Do you want it or not? Because you have to have it to get into the country. And you have to have this little yellow piece of paper, which is now meaningless, <laughs> other than the fact that it gets me into this country where I might get yellow fever. Right. But 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 it got better after that, right? Because uh, much like the feature film work that you've done, um, we got to Kenya and Tanzania, and uh, or Kenya first, and started the expedition. And the accommodations were just like you would have, you know, in the States, right? Hilton and... <laughs> I may have been looking at REI for my coats and my boots, but that is not where the tents came from that we were put in. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. Yeah. <laughs> Earl bought a bunch of cheap tents. On eBay. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like the tents yeah. were very much like our crew. They were all disposable. If we didn't come oh, if we man. didn't come back with them, what's the worst that could happen? <laughs> So, so, but on that trip, Andy, tell us about the uh, the very first kind of oh shit moment with with Tim. 
I can tell you about a better oh shit moment. This actually is probably a better a better way of describing what it was like to go from shooting commercials and music videos and feature work to this TV show. <laughs> the yellow fever thing, that was more like a mistake, just an accident. But this actually describes just the way it is to make this show on a daily basis, which is, you know, we've been traveling in this like convoy of Land Rovers and motorcycles from Nairobi down, you know, towards the border of Kenya and Tanzania into the beautiful landscape of all these national parks. We finally, you know, after like eight hours of traveling dirt roads and, you know, bouncing up and down, we get to this ranger station, which is even in a more remote place, and it's dusk, and we have to set up our tents. And I'm usually pretty gung-ho about about stuff like this, even though I don't have a ton of experience with it. Um, and so I was all excited and, like, getting my tent out. And then uh, I don't know which kind of random meal got me. <laughs> oh, no. But all of a sudden I felt uh, the call of nature, as it were. Sorry, when you say and this I, is a no-shit moment, this is literal. <laughs> yeah, yes. And um, I went up to uh, – Eric uh, from the Brick team who was leading this expedition. And I was like, where's the outhouse? You know, I thought I'd, I'd be cool and just go ahead and assume there were no bathrooms here, but surely there's like an outhouse. And he was like, uh, well, I mean, the bathroom is all around you. And he just kind of <laughs> gestured into the, the darkening void that was like the plains at sunset. And I uh, started walking out there, and he's like, I would grab a headlamp. <laughs> and I, you know, get a headlamp. And as I'm getting farther away, he's like, and, you know, keep an eye out for snakes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still, you know, I'm still walking out there because I'm so, you know, I like my privacy. And so I'm kind of going out. I see this kind of nice, large volcanic rock that looks like something I could squat behind. <laughs> And uh, as I'm, like, just at, like, you know, earshot, I hear him say, and if you hear any lions, just come back. <laughs> <laughs> that made it so easy and to do your business, didn't it? <laughs> I thought he was just trying to scare me until, like, the next day we saw, like, a fresh zebra kill that was, you know, from a lion. <laughs> <laughs> Hundreds of yards from the <laughs> So tell us about Tim. To set this up, Tim is the world's largest tusker. I think each one of his tusks are worth about $250,000 on the Chinese market. So we want to get a shot of Tim. Andy just happens to be along for the ride. Yeah, well, I distinctly remember um, sitting in the in yet another four-wheel drive vehicle of some kind, and looking, you know, out the window through kind of layers of trees and foliage and whatever. And you can see, you know, this trio of elephants and they're enormous. And then uh, Craig, different Craig, mm -hmm. says, and this is in the show, but he says, we can get closer if you want. <laughs> Which seemed like a Which great I, idea. And I think was the extent of our uh, safety briefing at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, we, we get out of the, the vehicle and we start kind of edging closer and closer to this trio of massive elephants. I mean, the biggest elephants I've ever seen. As we're walking towards them, um, Craig is like, if anything happens, don't move. Because if you, if you move, all of a sudden they can see you and they'll come after you. It's, they don't have great eyesight, so you can kind of like, just don't move and everything will be fine. And then we get close enough, you can like look at this elephant in the eyes. And they, it's like, it kind of looks like it can see you even when you're not moving. I don't know what he was talking about. I mean, I guess he was right, but I don't know. I guess it heard us or saw us or something because all of a sudden its ears like fly up. Like they just, you know, I didn't, it, I guess this is how elephants let you know they're upset. And it 
charged us out of no. I mean, it, it literally, <laughs> this elephant just ran at us. And it's like a, you know, they, a false charge. That's to scare us a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, there wasn't a tree big it did enough not, <laughs> to protect us. <laughs> yeah, I, I know this because I, I completely ignored what he said and immediately got behind the closest bush. <laughs> We have a little bit of this on film, but um, the cameraman had similar ideas, so he, you know, he He definitely he cut out, (laughs) lost that one as well. I will tell you, this is a little bit like the filming, though. I mean, again, these are some of our best shots are not stuff that we really scripted. It's so it's not cue the elephant. Yeah, cue the elephant. (laughs) The action, you know, it's like holy crap, run. Thankfully, yeah. Craig knew what he was doing and, you know, basically distracted the elephant and it stopped because I know he said it was a false charge, mm-hmm. but I don't buy it. <laughs> like, <laughs> so so uh, a, a couple days later, we go to cross uh, the Indian Ocean on what's called a dhow, which is this uh, boat that looks like it's from, you know, the 1500s or something. And the crew at near midnight sees the boat. We're going to cross the open ocean for five hours from Kenya to Tanzania. So what went your, through your brains as that as you approach the boat? Well, it strikes me as you say this that um, in both instances, like setting up the tent in the middle of nowhere and this Dow, you guys w- tend to wait it like plan it so that we would have anywhere from like six to 10 hours of travel before you sprung these things on us. And it was always- I will tell you, I actually walked up to the boat first and said, there's no way we're going to make it. But then I like, went back to Craig and I said, get the camera crew. And I just want to film this. Like, why? It's dark. I'm like, dude, you just want to catch this on camera the very first time they lay eyes on this dowel. And all of a sudden we're walking down this long wooden pier and we get to the edge, tide is out, and we're looking out at this kind of glistening muddy sandy shore and there looks like like a small ancient shipwreck <laughs> right like it had been us. abandoned honestly yeah. i thought it had been abandoned like a thousand years ago <laughs> that was absolutely not the case this was this is yeah. the boat i had a ticket on <laughs> like I just remember the crew, the the film crew, literally kind of almost mutinied, and were like, "We're not getting on that thing." <laughs> well, they understood that they had a lot of expensive equipment yeah equipment with them. and stuff too. We understood that we just got to get on that boat, and yeah, make a show. We got to make the show. So, Andy, uh, subsequent to that, I mean, it, it's all fun and games. We're having fun, but there are some you know issues uh, in doing this kind of work. We only pop in, you know, in and out, but people who live in these situations and stuff, um, you know, thinking about the first time, you know, you set foot on Burmese soil, knowing that their, you know, their government is one of the most oppressive military governments in the world, things like that. What does your family think about you taking these kinds of risks to do the show? I maybe didn't mention a whole lot about being in (laughs) Myanmar initially. (laughs) <laughs> but it's you know it's 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 hard. I mean, you guys know I don't even like flying. So on top <laughs> yeah. of the personal fear of just having to get on an airplane to go any to any of these places, knowing that you're going into places that are potentially dangerous, but you have to you know you have to kind of weigh the dangers. And for us, we take a lot of steps to ensure. That's actually not true. You guys don't take a lot of steps to ensure that, <laughs> takes, that I think everyone's we take, safe. We take a step <laughs> or some. We, we don't do completely insane things. We just do mostly insane things. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, we do do some research and we kind of figure out what is the danger and what's the cost benefit. You know, we knew what we were getting into when we went to, uh, to Yangon and, um, you know, we knew that it was, we weren't going to be putting ourselves in a position where we were calling a whole lot of attention to ourselves, or doing anything, any of the really, you know, covering any of the kind of volatile things that are going on there. But at the same time, we still snuck in with tourist visas. Right. Right. <laughs> Every time you go through an airport checkpoint with a drone and thousands of dollars worth of camera equipment, it can be a little sketchy uh, in non-Western airports. Yeah, no, it's it, honestly, for me, the most terrifying part of every trip is customs because you know that they could shut you down. 
you spent all this money to get there and you know that they could absolutely shut you down. Right. You'll have no recourse. Yeah. Now, aside from that kind of logistical stuff, one of the things, though, is that we usually have a pretty good idea of the people that we're following, the people we're going to interview. And we may not know a ton about the situation we're walking into, but we try to put ourselves with people that we can trust. I think that's a big part of it. We know that they're doing really interesting work day in and day out in these places. And we just have to be there for a week or two. So if they can do it all the time, yeah. we kind of put ourselves in their hands, right? That's the, really the only way to do it is like, at times it's easier to do that with the CEO of a big tent company in Nairobi than it is to do it with a punk rocker and yeah. Yangon, Myanmar. But at the end of the day, you know, they both, um, Eric and Jojo were, were amazing at kind of putting us in situations that were really interesting and also kind of letting us into their world. And that's what it's all about, you know? So it's, it's, there are some dangers for us, but not anything close to what the people whose stories we're telling have to deal with on a daily basis. Well, Andy, we're honored to have you as a uh, first part of our very first episode. Thank you for kind of sharing the funny moments and also the risks involved. We really appreciate it. Yep. And hopefully you're with us for the uh, long haul. Yeah. Um, at le- <laughs> as long as <laughs> at you least stay in spirit. Uh, alive. <laughs> Philanthropology is brought to you by First Republic. Since 1985, First Republic has had just one goal, deliver extraordinary service that always goes beyond client expectations. Because no two clients are alike, First Republic designs financial solutions for individuals and businesses that are customized to help meet your needs and goals. Reach out today and you'll be connected with a dedicated banker who will be your primary point of contact throughout your relationship with the bank. You can call, or email your banker at any time for advice or to get help with whatever arises. Because they understand your total financial picture, your banker can recommend the services and products that are best suited to you or your business. And they're committed to staying objective, so it's always about what makes sense for you at every stage and not about what's most profitable. If you're ready to discover how a personalized approach to banking can make a meaningful difference in your personal and business outcomes, visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. Member FDIC. How many people have come up to us and said, we would love to travel with yeah, you? Yeah, everybody wants to carry our luggage is <laughs> Every, the thing. What they don't see is what goes on behind the scenes because you know what you're not getting on our trip? You're not getting reward points. <laughs> you're not getting hotel Marriott. <laughs> the places know. we're staying, uh, right. you know, in Uganda, you kept saying, uh, you know, when you hear me say, stop the van, we're right. in trouble. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the thing. It's, it's every good story that we've ever had has been non-scripted. I think we walk into these situations and we say, you know what? I think we have an idea of who we're going to interview and what we're going to do. But because we keep our head on a swivel and we pivot quickly, all the good stuff has been uncued. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, examples of uh, the circumcision ritual. We're pulling up, we're stopped in a big traffic thing. There's a bunch of young youths coming out. They've got the, what do you call the machetes? Yeah, the, the congas or the, the yeah, yeah. The, the machetes basically. Yep. And I get out and they're surrounding me saying, money, money, money. And I close the door and lock it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I'm reaching for my wallet because I'm trying to find money, money, money because they've got these big machetes. Yeah, but oh, some oh. of the greatest footage was that, <laughs> Yeah, you know. And the Muslim revival, it was so funny to just come upon that and they, they're calling us over. They want us. They want you to marry you off to a, to a Muslim woman. Right. And, and like, they get you and I both reading the Quran. I'm <laughs> yeah. sure that that's being used for propaganda somewhere else. You know, but, but part of this is really honest these are very serious issues and you have to kind of process through the risks Mm -hmm. um so each one of these stories remind me of free burma rangers yeah that's a great story and Mm -hmm. uh, you and i worked on a film uh called free burma rangers which is about our good friend dave eubank right and sadly uh not too long ago one of his rangers zhao sang lost his life on the front line in syria yeah, I mean, Free Burma Rangers is a nonprofit organization. They're based kind of out of the northern part of Thailand. They started working in Burma and Syria and Iraq and some other places, but um, they really help the internally displaced people around the world. And that's, that's an example of people really doing really seriously dangerous work. 
and and the film itself is super powerful. Yeah, people Coming, ought to check it out. I yeah. mean, you can go to the website at www.fbrmovie.com. It's coming out February 24th and 25th in a Fathom event. And uh, I think it's going to be great. Oh, so it's going to be an watch, amazing. Watch for it. Check, really check it out because that is going to sell out. So, that, so we've learned, I mean, some of this stuff is funny and fun and stuff, but it, it can, there are risks involved. And you interviewed a guy who's amazing, Nick McDonald, um, and, and talked to him. Nick is one of those guys that has a career, worked in disaster re- response and recovery, and has been in some of the most difficult situations across the world. And Nick McDonald is, is one of those, you know, not a relief cowboy, but he's one of those guys that has operated in the Wild West when things go horribly wrong, and he has been in the thick of it. My name's Nick McDonald. I'm a humanitarian aid worker and social impact consultant. I started out in the mid late 90s uh, in the UK and I, my first real job I guess was with a small organization run by the Quakers that was dealing with refugees after the Bosnian war so I, I started out with them in in Belgrade and uh, I worked with them for a little while in Belgrade and then I moved to Croatia with uh, a few families of refugees uh, who were displaced from Croatia during the war. And we were basically running a little a little refugee return program that was about agricultural restarts and, and human rights around refugee return. Well, the first half of my career it really was in displacement and conflict. So I spent a lot of time dealing with people who had been forced from their homes, either as internally displaced people or as refugees, largely because of war. And it was, I guess, around 2005 that I made the pivot to work a little bit more on natural disasters. I I ended up in Sri Lanka for the Indian Ocean tsunami, and I was deputy director for Mercy Corps and Hurricane Katrina and Rita. So you think about what kind of people get into this type of work. You know, Nick McDonald's a good example, but... Who does this professionally? Who does it? And why do they do it? Well, there's a really diverse bunch of folks who who end up in this line of work, and and everybody has a story about what what drives them to, you know, leave a, a, a comfortable job at home and and go and work in an environment like that. You certainly get the caricature of the of the relief cowboys. Those those folks still exist, although I think they're rarer than they used to be. And you know, 20 years ago, I think the field would have been dominated by those folks. But what you've seen over the last 20 years is a real attempt to sort of professionalize and, and bring in standards of professional conduct, standards of, uh, of work in these environments, and really really make these environments more professional and, and more accountable. So I think now if you, if you walk into a, a relief office in a conflict setting, you're much more likely to find a, a more diverse range of folks. You'll find your, your kind of logistics relief cowboys who are, you know, fit that stereotype. But you're, you're much more likely to find people who are coming from other Southern world nations as well. So if you look at recruiting, most big aid agencies, their major recruiting no longer comes from Europe and America. You know, for, for a lot of agencies, their major recruiting now comes from within Africa, Asia, the Middle East. And you'll still find Europeans and Americans, but it's a much more diverse world than it used to be. Boy, this the Nick McDonald uh, content's really great, and it just you know iterate reiterates the fact that there are a lot of risks involved, but you can mitigate against those risks. Life is full of risks, and people that you know again run to the fire, run to the gunshots, or run to the action are the ones that you know take the biggest risk. But like you say, wise decisions in the heat of the moment can make all the difference in the world. Definitely. Well, look, I mean, there's, there's two ways to look at this because, yes, I mean, I, I have had friends and colleagues who have been through dreadful things and, and some of them um, have lost their lives doing this work. But let's pan back to the risk landscape as a whole and let's look at humanitarianism as a profession. And when you look at the number of people doing this work and, and where they're doing it and the, the sort of actuarial situation, you find that humanitarianism is not not in the top 10 most dangerous jobs in the, the people in the US do, right? It's about as dangerous, you know, in terms of deaths per capita per year as being a truck driver in the US. Uh, it's not as dangerous as being a deep sea fisherman. That's actually a job that is quite dangerous. A lot of truck drivers die every year. Uh, it's not something that we, you know, that we, that we panic about, though. It's a, it's, it is a risk. 
uh, when you look at the statistics, you find that that risk isn't evenly spread. It's it, it accrues disproportionately in about five countries in the world. And, and if you if you read the New York Times this year, you'll know which ones they are. And uh, it, it, the the main killer of of aid workers used to be road traffic accidents. Uh, about five or ten years ago. It, it became uh, deliberate violence. So those are still the two biggest killers of aid workers. So the risks are not just from hostile bad actors, like yeah. you say. It's not just people. No. You're, you're working against diseases and... Uh, it's whatever health. the gods want to throw down on the humankind, <laughs> right? It's volcanoes in New Zealand. It is, you know, tsunamis in Southeast Asia. Right. It's all the natural disasters. It's all the infectious diseases. It's all the things that uh, we do to each other and that we do to ourselves, it's all of it. And, and you were telling, uh, you were talking, when you were talking to Nick, you were talking about this uh, drug anti-malarial some people take called larium. Right. And it gives you hallucinations. Yeah, well, this is one of those things that's like an unintended consequence, right? You're trying to address this idea of, I don't want to catch malaria because that's bad. But then the effects of taking larium produce these hallucinogenic kind of visions of people. Nick had a great story about that. So we were in West Timor, uh, my, my wife and I. She wasn't my wife then, but she is now. And uh, this was at, a, at the time just after East Timorese independence. And the UN was running refugee camps there for people who'd fled East Timor. And they were also running a war crimes tribunal to try to prosecute people who'd fled East Timor into West Timor because they had committed war crimes. So it was a tense situation. Uh, we were, it was a malarial area and we were taking, I forget which one it is that gives you, gives you hallucinations. Larium, that was the one. Um, I was, we were on Larium and it was not doing me any good at all. I found myself feeling paranoid, feeling like, uh, people wanted to kill me. I had these awful dreams all the time. And it wasn't until the day that everything went wrong and the UN office got attacked and we had to evacuate in a hurry. And honestly, it was it still ranks in my top five worst days of my life that I realized it wasn't the larium. People, people were actually trying to kill yeah. us. You know what you could do instead? Work as an insurance agent in a cubicle. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a sponsor yet. That's an insurance agency yet. No. This episode of Philanthropology has been made possible by Advanced Micro Devices. AMD. They're in our tribe of do-gooders, and we're excited to have them along on this journey of doing good in the world. AMD is helping solve the world's toughest and most interesting challenges around climate action, quality education and good health, and well-being. Tomorrow's breakthroughs start with the determination and inspiration of today. Trust us, if you're going to do good, you need some smart people in your tribe. <laughs> yeah, people smarter than you and me for sure. <laughs> I think you and I growing up kind of in this world... Uh, think it really is the best job in the world. It is the best job. I mean, I think for the right kind of person, if it's if it's your thing, it's the best job in the world. I mean, you you get to you get to engage in problems that are that are genuinely important. You get to do things that you would never get to do in other lines of work. You get to meet people and, and go places that you would just just never have access to. I mean, it's an amazing job, but it, it's also a lifestyle. It's not it's not a nine to five. You know, you'll be away for months or years. It takes a toll on your personal life. It's something that is a you know an enormous kind of commitment. So it's, it's a question of, is that what you're looking for? And, and for some people it is, and I think it's a, a great line of work. So uh, philanthropology is going to be a fun ride. It's going to be an interesting ride. We're going to deal with all kinds of topics, white savior complex, money in philanthropy, things like religion. Right. So it, it, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. All these unintended consequences, all of this crazy cocktail of, you know, religion and politics and ethics and, you know, everything that screws up, you know, the good in the world and those people that are trying to solve it, you know, in a really complex background. These characters are amazing. And the fun part about this is, you know, the TV show is kind of limited to a certain time frame, and it's also got, you know, a lot of entertainment value. Mm -hmm. This is kind of, uh, we can drill down into some interesting topics and have fun with them. Right. This is going to be amazing. So check out our website. It's going to be philanthropology.tv. And there you're going to find behind the scenes, extended interviews, and some just funny stuff that Craig and I tend to get into. 
All right. So the next episode is a very serious, very interesting and difficult episode. I'm ready. Okay. You want to know what it is? Let's hear it. The White Savior Complex. The Philanthropology Podcast is recorded at In Your Ear Studios in Richmond, Virginia. With direction from producer Carlos Chafin, engineering help from Andrea Steffel, soon to be Bukite. Earl and I also get creative direction from Andy Dunsing, the Good Road Public Television Show. We also want to thank all of our do-gooders who gave us their time, support, and gray matter. And finally, we want to thank our original investors in all of this, our wives and kids. Specifically our wives who put up with us, Pam Bridges and Erica Martin. And to all the girls I've loved before. <laughs> <laughs>